So here we read in Jeremiah chapter 42, uh, we read the entire chapter of course, and we see here the, the people coming up to Jeremiah and they're asking him to go to God to find out and they say, whatever, whatever God says, we'll do it. Just, just tell us what we need to do. Okay, now I want to get more of a backstory for where we're at here to get this whole thing in context. At this point in the book of Jeremiah, this is after the Babylonian Empire, after Babylon has come in and defeated Judah. You know, they defeated Israel, they defeated Judah, and they had already taken them captive. So they're, they're defeated, they're done. Of course, Jeremiah has been prophesying about this all the way along. He's been saying, look, you know, don't, don't fight against them. Just be servant unto them and God will, God will be with you, you know. But this is what you need to do. And the whole time, the people have not been listening unto Jeremiah. They have not been hearkening unto his counsel. They have not been listening to or obeying the word of God. Okay? So now they have been taken captive. They have been, um, you know, for the, very, the vast majority have been taken captive. But they left like some of the weaker people of the land, some of, some of the, the, you know, the people who definitely weren't like princes and, and the nobility and everything else, like they were all taken away. But some of the poorer people of the land to, to be able to, to be vine dressers and to keep up with, with all the crops and fields and all the other things that go in there so the land just doesn't go desolate into the waste. They leave some people behind. And they set up um, Gedaliah as the governor of the, of the place. And he's there to set to rule. You know, even though they're under Babylonian rule, the, you always, you know, they always set up some lo locality uh, rule, you know, governors and things like that to just, to just kind of keep the peace and make sure that law and orders is being kept in the place where they're at. So um, flip back just two chapters of chapter 40. Where I'm going to just highlight some of the important events that have taken place now after Gedaliah is set up as governor. To get to where we are now, it's, it's kind of important just to understand everything that's going on in why they're going to Jeremiah and then how they behave after that. Look at verse number 7 of Jeremiah 40. It says, Now when all the captains of the forces which were in the fields, even they and their men, heard that the king of Babylon had made Gedaliah the son of Ahikam governor in the land and had committed unto him men and women and children and of the poor of the land of them that were not carried away captive to Babylon, then they came to Gedaliah to Mizpah. Even Ishmael the son of Nethaniah and Johanan, and Jonathan, the sons of Korea, and Sariah, the son of Tanhumeth, and the sons of Ephi, the Netophathite, and Jezaniah, the son of a Maacathite, they and their men, and Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, swear unto them and to their men, saying, Fear not to serve the Chaldeans, dwell in the land, and serve the king of Babylon, and it shall be well with you. So this is after Babylon, the armies leave. They set up Gedaliah. He's the governor in the land. And these people hear about that. They, they were already, you know, uh, hiding, if you will, from, from the Babylonian government, from, from the armies. These people, they're like small armies. They're, they're, you know, they're captains of forces. There's actually a little bit, you know, there's people that have remained. And they hear, oh, okay, Gedaliah is governor. And they come to him. Then they, they, they come out of their places wherever they were at. And they come to Mizpah, and Gedaliah basically tells them, okay, you know, don't worry. There's nothing anymore to fear. They've, you know, they've conquered us, but let's just serve the, the Chaldeans. Let's serve Babylon, and it'll be well with us here. And we can stay here. We could, we could you know, we could build and plant and, and, and stay and remain in, in, uh, in Mizpah. Jump down to verse number 13. It says, moreover, Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the captains of the forces that were in the fields came to Gedaliah to Mizpah and said unto him, Dost thou certainly know that Baalus, the king of the Ammonites, hath sent Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, to slay thee? But Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, believed them not. So one of the captains here, one of the men, Johanan, um, earlier we saw that there was these different, these different captains of forces that, that came unto Gedaliah. Well, Johanan approaches Gedaliah and he says, You know... He says, you know that um, Ishmael was sent by the, by the king of the Ammonites. He says, Ishmael was sent in just to destroy you. And Gedaliah didn't believe him. 
He's like, no, 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 that's, you know, that's not true. Ishmael's not out to kill me. Verse 15 says, Then Johanan the son of Korea spake to Gedaliah and Mizpah secretly, saying, Let me go, I pray thee, and I will slay Ishmael the son of Nethaniah, and no man shall know it. Wherefore should he slay thee, that all the Jews which are gathered unto thee should be scattered, and the remnant in Judah perish? So he's saying, look, the state of affairs right now is really fragile. Why should we let Ishmael come in and kill you? Then all the people are going to be scattered. There's going to be no ruler, no leader for them to follow. They're going to get all scared and everyone's just going to get dispersed. Instead of staying in Judah, everyone's going to you know, kind of be afraid of what's going on if you were to die. He says, let me just go and I'll assassinate Ishmael. I'll take care of him. He's offering to do this in, you know, in, his, in his loyalty and his support unto Gedaliah. Verse 16, But Gedaliah the son of Ahikam said unto Johanan the son of Korea, Thou shalt not do this thing, for thou speakest falsely of Ishmael. He didn't believe him at all. He's saying, You are lying about Ishmael. That's not true. He's not out to get me. He's not going to kill me. Well, look what happens. Turn to chapter 41, verse number 1. Chapter 41, verse 1 says, Now it came to pass in the seventh month that Ishmael the son of Nethaniah, the son of Elishamah, of the seed royal, and the princes of the king, even ten men with him, came unto Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, to Mizpah, and there they did eat bread together in Mizpah. Then arose Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and the ten men that were with him, and smote Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphat, with the sword, and slew him, whom the king of Babylon had made governor over the land. So, Johanan was telling the truth. He's saying, look, Ishmael's out to kill you, so what does he do? He didn't believe him. And Ishmael comes in and he kills Gedaliah. And it says in verse 3, Ishmael also slew all the Jews that were with him, even with Gedaliah at Mizpah, and the Chaldeans that were found there, and the men of war. So not only does he kill Gedaliah, but he kills, he kills all the people who are kind of keeping things together. You know, their, their, their force, you know, the security force or police force or whatever they had, you know, the, the men of war, and even the Chaldeans. You know, when, when the army leaves... Of course, there's always garrisons of troops left behind to be there just in case that, you know, to help rule the, the area you have. When you dominate someone, you always leave your forces behind to make sure things don't get out of hand. It's a much, much smaller troop, but it's still a presence of their military. Well, Ishmael came in and he killed all of them. Out. So he killed the Chaldeans and Gedaliah and anyone who was kind of with or surrounding or helping Gedaliah. He killed all of them. Jump down to verse 11. And then he leads the people captive. So Ishmael then just takes all the rest of the people that are behind the remnant of the people that he didn't kill. He takes them captive and he starts taking them away and all their stuff and everything. Verse 11 says, But when Johanan the son of Korea and all the captains of the forces that were with him heard of all the evil that Ishmael the son of Nethaniah had done, then they took all the men and went to fight with Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and found him by the great waters that are in Gibeon. So Johanan wasn't there, and these other captains of the forces, they weren't there at the time that this happened, obviously. So they hear about it, and they're like, no, no, we need to go take care of Ishmael now. And of course, they go to meet him, verse 13. Now it came to pass that when all the people which were with Ishmael saw Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the captains of the forces that were with him, then they were glad. So all the people that were taken captive by Ishmael, they see these other guys coming. They see Johanan and they start to be happy because, oh, great, here's someone to help us and to save us. We're not just being taken into slavery by Ishmael. They're going to come and set us free. And verse 14 says, So all the people that Ishmael had carried away captive from Mizpah cast about and returned and went unto Johanan, the son of Korea. So as soon as, you know, Ishmael's driving all of his captives and stuff away and, and trying to keep under control, whatever. Then when they see all these forces coming up, they just turn back and they just start running and go towards Johanan. And they're like, great, you know, thanks for saving us. And then uh, jump down to verse 17. It says, And they departed and dwelt in the habitation of Chimham, which is by Bethlehem, to go to enter into Egypt. So Ishmael ends up getting away, but they, you know, they, they leave and they don't come back again. And Johanan basically comes in and saves the day, right? Gedaliah is dead, though, at this point. So now the people who were left in charge of the Chaldeans are dead. The Chaldean soldiers were killed, too. So now we have this group of people, this small group of people. It's this weak, small, poor group of people. You know, no real significant force to be reckoned, you know, to reckon with anybody, really. There's just Johanan and these other people, and they need to figure out what they're going to do now. Because now there's going to be a sour taste 
Especially, in, you know, who knows what the king of Babylon is going to do. His own soldiers were killed, and the person that he appointed to be in charge was now also killed. So they set their face to go into Egypt. That's what verse 17 says. And they departed and dwelt in the habitation of Chimham, which is by Bethlehem, to go to enter in Egypt. That was their plan. They're saying, well, we're just going to go into Egypt. Egypt was not under Babylonian control. And they're just saying, you know what? We'll just go find a refuge. We'll find a stable. We'll just forget Judah. We're just going to go into Egypt. Verse 18, it says, Because of the Chaldeans, for they were afraid of them, because Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, had slain Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, whom the king of Babylon made governor in the land. They were afraid that, the, that Babylon was going to come back and then take them all captive back into Babylon or something because of what happened to Gedaliah. Because he, you know, they were thinking, well, he's going to hold all of us responsible for this and he's going to take us away. So they were afraid. So their plan was to go into Egypt. That's, a, that's chapters 40 and 41. We read chapter 42. This is now where they're seeking. They're actually going to seek counsel from God. They, they want to know what God thinks that they should do. Which is kind of funny because as I mentioned earlier, Jeremiah has been telling them the word of the Lord this whole time. And we see in his answer, he does go to God. He says, okay, I'll go to God. And what I like about this, the Bible says in verse 3 of chapter 42, where we start reading, it says, that the Lord thy God may show us the way wherein we may walk. This is the people asking Jeremiah, and the thing that we may do. Then Jeremiah the prophet said unto them, I have heard you. Behold, I will pray unto the Lord your God according to your words. And it shall come to pass that whatsoever thing the Lord shall answer you, I will declare it unto you. I will keep nothing back from you. Now, praise the Lord for a man of God like Jeremiah. This is something that we all ought to be thankful for when you could find somebody like Jeremiah who says, you know what? Whatever God says, I'll tell it to you. I won't hold anything back from you. Unfortunately, today we have too many pastors and preachers that are afraid to tell the people, to tell the congregation everything that God said, the whole counsel of God. They'll pick and choose the nice parts, the warm and fuzzy parts. They'll tell you about certain things, but they refuse to tell you everything because they either think you can't handle it or they're worried that you're going to leave because you get offended or whatever the situation may be. They think money bags is going to leave the church because, oh, because you're going to step on their toes and you're going to preach on whatever their sin is. That's not who Jeremiah was. And as a believer in Christ, you ought to want a Jeremiah to be preaching unto you. You ought to want to know what is it that God has said that we should be doing. What is the truth from God? Amen. Just lay it all out for me. I'm a grown-up. I can handle it, whether it be good, whether it be evil. Just let me know the truth. And I'll deal with it the way I have to deal with it, but I want to know what's true. Don't hold anything back from me. Don't treat me like a little child, like I'm not capable of, of understanding this stuff. And unfortunately, there's so many churches, you know, someone might just get saved and they'll be like, oh, well, we can't preach too hard now because that might drive them away. Look, if people's hearts are right with God, they're going to be, you know, it, it, you're doing them a disservice. I know when I finally got my heart right with God, it didn't matter what came across that pulpit. You're not going to drive me away because I just wanted to get right with God. And when I start hearing the things I need to change, I was thankful and glad that I was being reproved and reproached for all of my sins and all the iniquities and all the things that I was doing that were wrong because I wanted to get right with God. And you can't gear a, pre, you know, a sermon or preaching towards people whose heart isn't right with God anyways. Because it doesn't matter what you preach. If their heart's not right to do what's right by God, it doesn't matter what you preach. It doesn't matter how soft you make the message. They're not going to change anyways. Your heart has to be right. And it's not for you, you know, preacher man or pastor, to determine what somebody can handle. What's the truth going to be? You know, what's, what, what, what are they going to be able to, to stand? And what's going to drive them away? That is not for you to decide. You, our job is to preach the entire counsel of God, just like Jeremiah said, look, 
You ask me to go to God, I'll go to God. And I'll return God's answer again. And I'm going to tell you everything that he says. Verse number uh, 5 says, Then they said to Jeremiah, The Lord be a true and faithful witness between us. If we do not, even according to all things for the which the Lord thy God shall send thee to us, whether it be good or whether it be evil, we will obey the voice of the Lord our God to whom we send thee, that it may be well with us when we obey the voice of the Lord our God. Now this answer in verse number six, this is the exact answer that we are, every single one of us ought to have. These are the right words. Now what we're going to see, the problem with these people is they were just words. They said the right thing, but in their hearts, they didn't believe it. They were saying, they knew what to say, what was the right thing to say, but they didn't follow through with it. They didn't do it. And that is the key critical flaw of this people. They could hear it and say, oh yeah, we just want to do what's right by, by whatever God has me to do. I just want you to know, tell me the truth. I can deal with it, good or bad. Let me know and I'll do it. It's easy to say, oh yeah, I'll do it. It's another thing to actually follow through and then to believe it and then to actually do it. And we need to be, we need, you know, we need to be a cut above the rest. We need to be able to separate ourselves from the rest of this modern lame Christianity that doesn't separate themselves from sin, that doesn't actually listen to the word of God. And then, you know, like a lot of Christians today will do, they'll start making excuses for the Bible and they'll start trying to twist the meaning and have it say, so, well, that's not really, you know, that's what it says, but that's not really what it means. And start coming out with excuses to justify their sins. It says what it says, and we just need to accept it and believe it and, and, and keep moving forward. Let's see how they respond in, in chapter 43. We didn't read chapter 43 yet. Look at verse number 1, because this is after Jeremiah goes through. He tells them everything, and he says, look, he even says, Jeremiah even says, he says, here's, here's what God said. He says, stay here in the land. He says, don't, don't be afraid. Don't fear the king of Babylon. Don't fear what they're going to do. Don't fear the famines. Don't fear the war. Don't fear any of that stuff. Look, God will take care of you. God will bless you. But this is where you need to stay. You need to stay right here. You know, stay put. Be servants under the Chaldeans. And everything will be fine. Don't go into Egypt. And he warns them, don't do it. Do not go into that. If you go into Egypt, he says, the famines that you wanted to get away from, they're going to follow you into Egypt. The sword that you're trying to get away from and, and find safety in Egypt, it's going to follow you into Egypt. He says, you will die in Egypt. Don't go into Egypt. You're, all these fears and all these concerns that are driving you to go into Egypt, don't do it. You're going to find all of those in that place when you disobey God's word. He says, stay right here. But then he even, he even ends off just saying, you know what? I know you're not going to do it. Basically saying, I've told you all this stuff, but you're not going to listen anyways. Why would he say something like that? Because the entire, his, his whole career of preaching unto them, they didn't listen. So why is he even going to expect them now to say, oh yeah, we're going to listen all of a sudden? He's like, you didn't, you're not going to listen to me. But let's see, let's see the reaction in chapter 43. Look at verse number one. It says, And it came to pass that when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking unto all the people, the words of the Lord their God, for which the Lord their God had sent him to them, even all these words. Then spake Azariah the son of Hoshiah, and Johanan the son of Korea, and all the proud men, saying unto Jeremiah, Thou speakest falsely. The Lord our God hath not sent thee to say, Go not into Egypt to sojourn there. But Barak the son of Neriah said it thee on against us, for to deliver us into the hand of the Chaldeans, that they might put us to death and carry us away captives into Babylon. So Johanan the son of Korea and all the captains of the forces and all the people obeyed not the voice of the Lord to dwell in the land of Judah. They just got done saying, Whatever you say, God says, I'll do it. Whatever it is, hey, if it's good, if it's bad, we'll do it. So he tells them, and what do they say? You're lying. That's, that's, not, that's not what God said. We know, 
So what were they really doing when they told them to, to go to God and to give an answer and, and they'll do whatever God said? What they were really saying is, tell us what we want to hear and say that it's from God. That's what they were really, that's what they were really after. Because when they don't hear, they don't like the response, they don't actually hear God's word, they just say, oh yeah, you're lying. That's not what God wants. If you know that's not what God wants, why did you even send Jeremiah in the first place to see what, what God wanted to do and what God wanted them to do? It's because they didn't care. They don't care. They have a stiff neck. They don't care what God, they just want to be told that what they're doing is okay. And honestly, this is, this is something that's common among everybody, okay? People will oftentimes come to a pastor and ask questions on things and say, well, I want to know what's right to do in this situation. I want, I want to know if what this is doing is right. And almost every single time without fail, the person asking the question, now look, it's not, it's not anything against people who come and ask questions. It's, don't, so don't take this the wrong way and don't feel like you can't ask a pastor a question or something like that either because I am open for questions. I love to answer questions if I can help in any way. But what I've noticed and what I've found to be true is that the people who come and ask these type of questions usually has something to do with sin, a certain sin, and say, well, what's the, what's the right thing to do? How do I deal with this? They already know the answer. They know what's right to do. But the reason why they go to the pastor is because they think, well, maybe there's a chance that he'll say that what I really want to do is okay. And then I could get approval from the pastor and then do whatever it is that I want, that I really secretly want to do, whatever, this, you know, whatever the sin may be, instead of just knowing, look, this is what God's word says, and I'm just going to do it because that's what's right. And they're, they're, you know, people are always looking for this extra justification. And that's what they were trying to do with Jeremiah. They said, okay. They already knew they wanted to go into Egypt. They were already planning that. They were planning that in chapter 41. That was their goal and their plan and their mission was, well, we're just going to go into Egypt because we'll be safe there. But they say, okay, well, let's get a little bit more confirmation on this from Jeremiah. And when they don't get what they want, they do it anyways. And they just say, well, you're lying. You're a false prophet. And that literally, what they're doing is saying, Jeremiah, you're a false prophet. Now, what's the audacity of that? Jeremiah has been right about everything that has come to pass. When they thought he was crazy about the Babylonian you know, armies coming in and destroying Judah and stuff, and everyone else was saying, you know, God's with us. You know, we're going to fight them and we're going to win. And he says, no, don't do it. You're going to make it way worse for yourself. They came in and he was right. The whole time, every single prophecy he's been saying has been happening in their lifetime. He's not been prophesying things that are going to come in 20 or 40 or 60 or 100 years from now where like, everyone in that time is going to be passed away anyways. He's prophesying things that are happening, current events, and they're all coming to pass the way that he says. He, he has the proof in his preaching, backing him up all the way up to this point. And they still call him a liar. It's unbelievable, right? But that just goes to show you when, when people are really into and entrenched in whatever it is they want to do and being stiff-necked, there's no reasoning. There's no listening. It's just, nope, this is what I want to do. It's a common reaction to have with sin in general. I've seen this with, with plenty of people. They might be stuck on a certain thing and they just don't want to get rid of it. Certain sin, I just, I just don't want to give this up. And you can try to persuade them and show them and show ample evidence from the Bible. And be like, look, God said this, God said this, God said this. But they don't want to receive it. A good example would be like drinking alcohol. Trying to show someone, look, drinking alcohol is a sin. It's not for a Christian to drink alcohol. And someone says, well, no, I don't believe that. And they'll, say, they'll start bringing up things like, well, Jesus turned water into wine. What about all these people saying wine, you know, all, all this, these references to wine? How can that be bad? And then you go through and you take them through all the verses. You take them through Proverbs. You take them through all of the verses and, 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 and show them all the proofs and say, no, look, brother, you know, you're, you're wrong. You're in error. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It's not for kings. It's not for us as, as priests and kings of God that, that have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of us to be, to be drinking a poison. That's not for us to do, even in a small amount. God doesn't want you consuming poison. 
He wants you to be sober. Okay? And, and I'm not going to get all into the alcohol, but it's something that people just, they, they don't want to hear it any other way because they like having their drinks. Even if they don't go out and get drunk or whatever, there's, you know, some Christians, well, I, li I like having wine with my steak or whatever. I just, I do, they just don't want to give it up for whatever reason. They don't want to give it up. And you just, no matter what you do, you can't persuade them and then just be like, oh, well, that's not what the Bible says. Like, oh, that's not what the Bible, look, I don't think the Bible could be any clearer about this. I understand if you don't know the Bible, if you, and if you haven't seen all the verses, if you haven't seen all the evidence, but once you have, you're presented with the, the contrast between the wine that's like the wine of Sodom versus the good wine, which is, which is the wine that, that maketh the heart merry, that, that God talks about as a good thing to have. You can see it's talking about two different beverages altogether. There's one that's the poison of asps, the poison of dragons, and it's all in a negative context. And then there's another wine that's good and fine and great. Two different things. They're absolutely different in the Bible. You, you can get it by the context. It's easy to see. It's easy to see unless you just don't want to believe it. What Jeremiah was telling him, you know why this was easy to believe? Because that's what he's been saying all along. Stay where we're at. Obey the Chaldeans. Be servant unto them. It's easy to see that because his message hasn't changed. It should, they should have already known that that's probably going to be the answer. God doesn't want us going into Egypt. God wants us right here. His word hasn't changed. Jeremiah says, fine, I'll go to God again. Guess what God says? The same exact thing. Look, stay put. This is what I have for you to do. Don't fight against them. Don't go running away. Stay right here. The message hasn't changed, but they didn't want to receive it. They couldn't believe it. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit lost in my notes here. Bad things happen a lot in people's lives. Now, we see here the event that happens. It's a, it's a disaster, right? I mean, they had just gotten taken over. All these people were taken away captive. And now their governor was killed and everything else. And, and they're, they're really in a predicament because there's a lot of uncertainty. And there's a fear and concern that they could all be killed, they could all be taken captive, or whatever, you know, all these bad scenarios that might be happening. And I think one of the reasons why they even turn to Jeremiah at all is just because, not just for their, to, to just solidify what they wanted to do already anyways, but when people go through rough times, they often will turn to God, right? They'll say, well, what should we do, God? When, when all throughout, when they're in, in, the, in their life normally to that point, when they're proud and they don't think they need God for anything, they're never going to go to God for anything. But when you get brought low and you start going through disasters and turmoil and all kinds of things are, are going wrong, that's usually when people get broken and, they, and they, they decide, you know what, I will turn to God. And you know what? That's the right attitude to have. And like I said, the things that they said were the right things to say, but it shouldn't have just been words. They should have been things that they meant that is the proper attitude because they said the right thing. But we need to make sure that we don't just let ourselves say something that we don't mean, especially when it's the right thing to do, that we should mean to do the right things that, that we're looking to do. Now, one of the problems I noticed about these people specifically is that they didn't even know their Bible. When they were going to Jeremiah and asking him to talk to God, you know, they're saying, okay, Jeremiah, you go to God and you pray for us. They should have known the Lord well enough to, to be able to, uh, to pray themselves. But look at chapter 42. Look at verse number 20. This was their, their key flaw. It says, For ye dissembled in your hearts when ye sent me unto the Lord your God, saying, Pray for us unto the Lord your God, and according unto all that the Lord our God shall say, so declare unto us and we will do it. And now have I, now I have declared, now I have this day declared it to you, 
But ye have not obeyed the voice of the Lord your God, nor anything for the which he hath sent me unto you. He's saying, you haven't obeyed. You haven't done anything. Now therefore know certainly that ye shall die by the sword, by the famine. He's, he's already pronouncing the judgment on him. saying, you're going to die by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence because you don't listen. He says, in the place whether you desire to go and to sojourn. He says, just know for a certainty you're going to go to Egypt and you're going to die there. And, uh, but the problem was from verse 20, it says, ye dissembled in your hearts. They, they weren't being honest. They were saying it and not believing it in their hearts. So they hear some hard preaching, right? Straight from the word of God and they call the preacher a liar. Now I could stand up here and not hold anything back and preach God's word and preach it the way it is and preach on sin. And you know what? It may step on some people's toes. It may get a little, you know, start thinking like, man, you know, you're talking directly to me. It may be uncomfortable. It may not be what you wanted to hear today. It may not be what you like to hear. You can go ahead. You can call me a liar and you can leave and get all upset about it and say, well, I'm just going to do it anyways. You know, oftentimes these days, you know, women get all upset when they preach against women wearing pants and just say, you know what, men should dress like men, women should dress like women. And God has commandments that say that, you know, the, the woman should not wear that which pertains to a man and a man should not put on a woman's garment. And, you know, I, I went over this. I'm not going to get into this too deeply. But these are the types of things. These are the buttons, the hot button issues today where people get all upset about it and they get angry and then they just say like, well, you, you know, he's just lying. That's not what the Bible says. That's not what God's word says. Go ahead. Call me a liar. But I don't mind being, you know, being called names or, or if someone says that I'm a liar. That's, that's fine with me. You better make sure, though, that what I'm saying is not found in the Bible if you're going to do that. Because if I'm saying something that's just incorrect and wrong and it's not found in the Bible, then by all means call me a liar. Say that what I'm saying isn't true. And again, you know, go ahead and do it. I mean, plenty of people call me a liar anyways. It's not going to hurt my feelings any. But... If what I'm saying is found in the Bible, then when you call me a liar, it's not really me that's lying. If what I'm saying is true and you can see it in Scripture, and if it, if it is here, you're calling God the liar and not me. And then you better be careful about where your heart is and what you're saying and what you're doing. Because my job is to preach his words, not my own, not my own thought, but what I am supposed to do is to give the understanding of the words and apply it in our lives the, the way that needs to be. I mean, anybody can, can read the Bible for themselves. The preacher's job, the pastor's job is to teach it and to apply it and say, well, this is what this means and, you know, and give the understanding of it. Not just reading the words. I mean, we could have a robot up here just reading God's word. The whole point of preaching is to expound on it and to expand on it and to use all of the principles that are found here, put them all together and say, look, this is what God's saying. God made a difference between men and women. God wants them to look different. There's all these different, different uh, passages that we can look at to see what is God's mind and his thoughts about these things. Does he care about these things? Yes. He does care about them. It only makes sense. You know, it, it, it only follows through that, um, you know, men should have long hair and all this other stuff. You know, or when I, when I preach on, uh, on, on alcohol, saying, you know, the Bible says, Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. These are conditions on a wine. When it does this, when it looks like this, don't look at it. Don't even look at it. Let alone drink it. He says, don't even look at it. There's a lot of sins that can, be, that can be preached on that can rub you the wrong way. And I'm not, there's a few more I have in here, but, but I've been hitting them lately anyways. And by now, you should know them, the hot button ones. And you know I'm going to continue to preach through everything that I see because I don't always know what people's sins are anyways. I usually don't know. I have no idea. And I don't want to know. I don't want to know what your sins are. But I'm going to continue to preach the whole counsel of God and then maybe one of these days I'm going to hit something that, that you're guilty of, something that, that you have not wanted to get rid of yet. What's your reaction going to be? Again, if it's coming from God's Word, what's your reaction going to be? If it's not God's Word, call me a liar all day long. It's not a problem. But if it's coming from the Bible, if it's coming from His words, 
How are you going to respond to that? Are you just going to say, no, you're a liar. I'm just going to keep on doing it anyways? Because we see where that's going to get you. These are the Lord's words. You may not even like them. You may not want to obey them. You could sit there and call me a liar, but this is what the Bible says. If you don't like it, then you'll just have to take that up with God. Now, look at these people that didn't listen. The Johanan and, and these other people that they, they decided not to listen to what Jeremiah was saying. Um, it says that they were proud, and I'm looking for the exact verse. It says, and all the proud people. Uh, verse 2 of chapter 43. It says, Then spake Azariah, the son of Hoshiah, and Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the proud men, saying unto Jeremiah, Thou speakest falsely. The Lord our God hath not sent thee to say, Go not into Egypt to sojourn there. It's always the proud person that doesn't want to humble themselves to receive correction. People who can't be told that they're wrong. This is the worst attitude to have when trying to receive God's word. When you go to God and when you ask and when you say something like, God, whatever you say, I'm going to do it, you better make sure you're humble and that you mean it. See, they didn't mean it. They dissembled in their hearts. They were proud. They were lifted up. They still thought that what they thought was best regardless of what the word of the Lord was that came back. They were proud. They couldn't, they couldn't handle that, what they thought was actually wrong. Because, I mean, if you use just worldly wisdom, their plan makes sense. We don't know what Babylon's going to do. Here's Egypt. Egypt has been a formidable force for a super long time. We'll find safety in Egypt. Everything will be fine. Let's just go over there. Sounds great, right? Except you're in complete disobedience unto God's law, unto God's word, I should say, not necessarily his law, but what God told you to do. You're in <coughs> direct contradiction to what he said. So when you disobey God's word, it doesn't matter where you go. It's not, your plan isn't going to work. You're not going to outsmart God. And this is what, turn if you would to Mark chapter 7. Because this whole story reminds me of what Jesus said unto the, um, to the Pharisees and the scribes. We're going to wrap it up with this. It's a real simple, it's a simple message tonight. It's just, it, it's really just a matter of making sure our hearts are right to receive correction and that we do have the, the proper attitude of going to God and just and praying unto God and saying, God, I want to know what it is that you have for me to do. Please teach me. Please instruct me. Tell me what it is that you want me to do and then to do it. And then follow through and do it and don't be a hypocrite. The last thing you want to be is a hypocrite of, of someone who says all the right things but does none of them. That's who the Pharisees were. Jesus Christ said, you know, the things that they say to do and the things that they teach, observe those things and do them. But don't do like they do because they say and they do not. He says, the things that they tell you to do, they don't do that. But what they're saying to do, you should be doing. So do that. But don't, but don't follow them as an example because they're just hypocrites. That was his advice unto them about the Pharisees. But look at Mark 7, verse number 5. The Bible says, Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? So they see his, his disciples you know, eating corn and, and they take it and they eat it and they're saying, Well, wait a minute. They didn't go wash their hands first. Right? Like their parents or something. You, know, you didn't wash your hands. They tell their kids, wash your hands before we eat dinner. Now look, there's nothing wrong with washing your hands before you eat a meal at all. And Jesus isn't rebuking them for that. But what they're doing is they're making that as if it's one of God's rules. See, God never once said in the Bible, you must wash your hands before you eat a meal. Not once. So that's not a commandment from God. Now, it's a commandment for man. And if you have that commandment that, that, like in my household, everyone has to wash their hands before they eat. There's nothing wrong or sinful about that. But it, if I were to say, it's a sin if you don't wash your hands because God says we have to do it, then I'm wrong and I'm in error. And then I'm elevating a commandment of man unto a, a commandment of God. And this is what the Catholic Church does. 
This is what Judaism does. They take commandments of men and they try to ele elevate them unto commandments of God. But let's see how, how Jesus answers them in verse 6. He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah, Isaiah is just Isaiah, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. He's saying, you guys are, this is exactly what Isaiah was talking about. He prophesied about you when he said, you honor God with your lips, but your heart is not in it at all. That's what these people did with Jeremiah. They, they honored him with the lips. They were honoring God. They said, God, we want to do whatever it is you have us to do. But their heart was far away from that. They had, they had no intention of actually following through unless it lined up with what they already wanted. Verse number seven. He said, Jesus continues to rebuke him. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. He's saying, he's saying you're teaching this as if it's a doctrine, like a, like a doctrine of God, but it's really just a commandment of men. Verse 8, for laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things ye do. And he said unto them, full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, now he's going to give him an example of exactly what he's talking about. He's saying, not only are you elevating your commandments to be like a doctrine of God, but you completely reject the commandments of God and all you're doing is just living by your own rules and by your own standards and by your own doctrines and your own things that you set up and your teachings of man and you've rejected all the teachings of God. And he gives them this example of one of the Ten Commandments. In verse number 10, For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. Those are two commandments there. From the Bible, from the, the Word of God, that we are to honor our father and mother, and whoso curses their father and mother, he says they're supposed to be put to death. Those are both found in the Old Testament, in the Law of Moses. But look at what they did with it. Verse 11. But ye say, if a man shall say to his father or mother, it is korban, that is to say, a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. So what's interesting here now, and I want to point this out real briefly, it's the last point I'm going to make, is people don't understand that word honor. Honor is not solely just about respect. It's not just respect. There's more to it than that as we see here because Jesus was contrasting God's law versus their law and their law nullifies God's law. Now, did we see anything in their law about them just like not just showing disrespect under their parents? Not really. The way that they did it, the way that they did not honor their parents was by not taking care of them when they needed it. Because it says, you know, if a man shall say to his father or mother, it is korban, which is just another word for a gift. You say, well, whatever I do for you, whatever thou mightest be profited by me, Anything, whatever it is I might do for you, you better just take that as a gift, buddy, to their parents. Saying, oh, you're in need? Well, I'm not obligated to take care of you. That's not something that I need to do. And whatever I do for you, you better just be thankful for it and treat it as a gift. That's what they're saying that they're allowed to do with their parents. They're saying that's just fine. That was the law of the Jews. As opposed to God's law that said you need to honor your father and mother. And honor, like I said, it's more than just a respect. It's taken care of. We need to, you know, it is, it is the responsibility, I believe, of the children. If your father or mother, you know, maybe one of them gets widowed and then they get sick and they can't do anything and they can't take care of themselves and, and they need help, look, the children need to take care of them. That's why in the Bible goes through this about widows who are widows indeed that don't have the immediate family to take care of them. Right? It, it goes through all the criteria and qualifications for a widow to be taken care of by the church because they don't have anyone else. So, okay, yeah, well, the church is going to take care of you because it's like another family. But it's only going to do so when the, 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 you know, the, the flesh family isn't around. 
to take care of them because it is their responsibility. It is the responsibility of the, of the son and, you know, and daughters or whatever to take care of their parents when they're in need. But what the Jews did, what the Pharisees did, is they said, no, 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 no. We don't have to, we don't have to like, take care of our parents when they need it. You just better treat that as a gift instead of being obligated to take care of their family. And that's how they made the word of God of none effect because they're saying, no, that's absolutely just fine. You don't have to take care of your parents. Anything you do for them, they could just consider that a gift. And this is one of, you know, and, and I haven't uh, really gone into this ever before, but every once in a while, I'll listen to Dave Ramsey on my drive home. You know, I listen to the Bible usually. I'll listen to, to, to things like that or some preaching or something like that. And, you know, but sometimes I'll just turn the talk radio on. And he came on one night, and I don't listen to it for very long usually because it's just kind of stupid. But um, so I'm listening to it, just hearing these people's stories. And then I, I could not believe it when he said, you know, they, they had this situation. It was a married couple, a husband and wife, and they were talking about taking care of one of their parents who needed help. And he almost verbatim was saying like to tell them that look, buddy, you know, basically like, look, I'm taking care of you and you just better be thankful for whatever I do for you. And if you're not, then I don't have to help you out. And what he was doing is exactly what the Pharisees were doing. His counsel was a Pharisee. His counsel was to say, you know what? Whatever I do for you, you better treat that as a gift as opposed to an obligation. He, he even said, you're not obligated to take care of them. Well, Dave Ramsey, yes, you are, according to Scripture. You are supposed to honor your father and your mother, and you are supposed to take care of them if they're in need. That is an obligation. That is something that you need to do as, a, as, a, as children. Amen. And that's what we see taught here in the Bible. But we need to make sure... Just the broad scope of the sermon. Our hearts are right. That when we hear something, that we don't have this attitude of, of pretending or saying to ourselves, well, whatever the Bible says, I'm going to do it. And then not really wanting to do it. And secretly just being like, well, I'm not really going to do that anyways. I'm just going to say that I'm going to do it, but I really don't want to. We need to, we need to, to stop that wicked attitude and say no. I actually am going to do, this is what the Bible says, it may not be easy, it may be kind of difficult, I may need to make a change, it might, it might even be embarrassing, it might be something that, that, you know, whatever. But I'm just going to do what's right today. I'm going to receive it and, and start doing it because it's coming from God's word and I love God and I want to obey him. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. We thank you for the great instruction that you've given us. God, we thank you for these, these easy set of rules really is what it is. But we make things complicated. We make things difficult. We have this flesh that's driving us to do things and, and that, that we ought not to be doing, Lord. But the flesh can be strong sometimes and, and pulling us in these directions, Lord. Help us to overcome that flesh and to, to really be sincere in our hearts that when we decide that we will listen to what your word says, that we truly will follow through with that, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.